Guten Tag, WAP. This is Mr. Linegar. Let's make history today as we go over Unit 2, Day 12. We're going to spend the next two days going over Africa during the early modern period. But let's get started with our daily punishment. Never discuss infinity with a mass mathematician. They can go on about it forever. <laughs> Your key terms for today are Benin, Oyo Asante Dahomey, those are three kingdoms, Congo, Nyongo, Queen Naginga, the Great Trek, Vasco da Gama. We're going to go over the political characteristics of Africa at the time of European exploration, the areas that were tough, touched and left untouched by European exploration, religious changes and continuities in Africa during the early modern period. So let's start talking about West Africa first. West Africa, a lot of the area were known as the Forest Kingdoms. The first kingdom we're going to go over is Benin. It's in southern Nigeria. They had a hereditary and centralized monarchy that ruled through the royal court. They expanded into an all-out empire in the Nigerian region. The people and cities formed rudimentary class system with crafts and art guilds. Slave trade was never a huge deal there. Between 1500 and 1800, they're going to uh, be incorporated into the European mercantile capitalist activities. After the Europeans come, they will start capturing slaves to export for the Portuguese for guns and gold. Some of the smaller kingdoms in Nigeria were called Oyo Asante Dahomey. They were three tribal kingdoms. They're going to derive an immense amount of wealth from the slave trade. They're going to trade enemy tribes for, with the Portuguese in return for guns and gold. They're going to get new forms of government, divine right monarchies, councils and bureaucracies and art. And they're going to use those weapons to try to conquer other parts of West Africa. Let's talk about Central Africa. Central Africa had a powerful kingdom uh, after the 14th century. They're going to establish diplomatic and commercial relationships with per Portugal in 1482. One of the people you should know is King Alfonso. Uh, he, was an actual, he was not on the key terms, but he actually should be. He's going to convert to Christianity in the 16th century, and he will uh, convert to Roman Catholicism. Even though he converts to Catholicism and Congo becomes a Catholic African kingdom, the Portuguese are still going to do slave raiding there. He's going to actually write to the Pope and ask the Pope to make, get the Portuguese to stop, and the Pope will ignore him. They will try to go to war against the Portuguese, Congo will, it will not be overly successful. Another Central African civilization was the Kingdom of Nyongo. They're going to attract Portuguese slave traders, missionaries. Queen Nzinga is going to lead a war against the Portuguese from 1623 to 1663. She is going to be able to block Portuguese uh, advances, but she can't kick them out entirely. Nyongo also will become Catholic and eventually the Portuguese will get control over them. In the end of the 17th century, Nyongo was a Portuguese colony of Angola. They're going to rule Angola until 1972. They'll use it for coffee production. They'll create plantations there. There'll be constant slave trade out of the region to Brazil until the mid-1850s, which is horrible. This right here just shows some of the African civilizations you see Songhai, Congo, Asante, Benin, some of the big ones we talked about. In East Africa, we have the Swahili city-states who we've talked about before. Uh, the Swahili city-states were Islamic uh, city-states that were a combination, a blend of Islamic and Bantu culture. When Vasco da Gama circumnavigates Africa, he's gonna force some of the city-states to pay tribute, like he does that to Kiwa in 1502. Uh, the Swahili city-states will adjust to the Portuguese and the Turks. Their trade will be disrupted by both the Portuguese and Turks. Gold, slaves, and ivory will continue to the Middle East. Most slaves from the Swahili, Swahili, Swahili city-states will still go to the Middle East, but some of them will be sent to uh, Brazil. Although, a majority of the slave trade uh, is still from the western part of Africa, not the eastern part. Southern Africa was the least area affected by the Atlantic slave trade. It was dominated by regional kingdoms. For example, the Great Zimbabwe, which is located 
kind of on the border of Southern and Central Africa. Europeans will start to come to Southern Africa after the 15th century. The Portuguese were the first ones to visit the area when they circumnavigated Africa. The Dutch will be the first ones to land a colony there, the Cape of Good Hope. In 1795, the British will take over their land and they'll take over the southern tip of South Africa. The Dutch are going to flee the British. The Dutch will move to the northern part of South Africa, uh, away from the British, and form another colony, kind of modern-day Rhodesia. And when the Dutch flee the British, that's called the Great Trek. Let's talk about the uh, religions in Africa. Islam was popular in West Africa, Swahili city-states. A lot of times Islam was blended with indigenous beliefs and customs, so it was syncretic. We still had monophyte Christianity in the eastern, northeastern part of Africa, in Egypt, the Sudan, Ethiopia. Roman Catholicism will come to some parts of Africa, like in central West Africa, in Angola, Congo, Nyongo. A lot of times, even Roman Catholicism will blend with traditional beliefs. You'll see the Dutch Reformed Church established in South Africa, along with the Church of England, because both the Dutch and the English take over that area. Overall, most of Africa still will be animistic, especially once you get out of these coastal areas. They still will be animistic and have traditional beliefs. But you are seeing a lot of new beliefs come to this area during this time. All right, guys, that's all I have for you for today. Until next time, d -d -d deuces, deuces, deuces.